had enough of the been there, done that ideas, tired of too much talk and so little action. Rewind now and welcome to Transformation and Change Radio with Dr. Kathy O'Bear, where the vision of true equity, inclusion, courage, and purpose meet powerfully. Dr. Kathy delivers with dynamic, engaging conversation and the most authentically brave dialogue on air today. This hit show will challenge you to explore current issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion and deepen your capacity to choose courage to speak up to greater inclusion in everything you do. Fasten your seatbelts and accelerate your effectiveness to become a powerful change agent in your life, community, job, and society. Imagine true equity and inclusion and get the tools to really manifest your vision. No frills, no fluff, just really powerful, good stuff. Transformation and Change Radio starts now. Welcome to Center and Transformation Change Radio. I'm here for our 12th and final conversation on dismantling class and classism with Dr. Becky Martinez, Infinity Martinez Consulting. Oh, Hello. I'm feeling both excited to be in this conversation with our guest, the Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington, and sad that this is coming to an end. And so if I forget to say it at the end, Becky, I just want to personally thank you at my soul for saying yes to come on this journey with the audience, with me, to share best thinking, to meet with people about what are the dynamics of class and classism and how do we work to dismantle it and just try to put more out there because I don't think there's anywhere near enough. So thank you for all you've done to support me, get sharper, better, more committed. You're welcome. It's been a great, uh, it's been a great uh, year adventure and talking about things that are so meaningful to me, um, as well as meaningful to the work uh, around occlusion, particularly with the social class and class identity framework and lens. So it's been a joy. Mm. And what a way to have our final episode with the Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington of Washington Consulting Group. Thank you for coming back to the show, our dear friend. Absolutely, absolutely. This is my absolute joy. And um, uh, not only is it with two of my favorite people in the whole planet universe, um, but also the topic that feels very close to my heart. Um, and one that we don't spend uh, nearly enough time engaging uh, how it shows up and impacts our lives. So just glad to be here with your brilliance and to have this wonderful conversation. I yes. know, I really have us as family mm -hmm. and just feel so grateful because I know you and I have played for over 35 years. If people right. don't know you, there are at least three or four previous radio shows and other recordings that I know we've done. Um, Washington Consulting Group, so for over, 35, 36 years, you have been an active change agent leader to dismantle oppression, create true social justice and liberation in higher ed and many other industries. Um, you come out of higher ed, and that's when our paths crossed. President of ACPA recently, president and co-founder of the Social Justice Training Institute with the three of us, our faculty your work as a pastor with Unity Fellowship Church of Baltimore and an elder in the Unity Fellowship Church movement. I mean, there's so much folks can get on your website and learn more. But as I've grown with you, I mean, I'm a different change agent because you have been in my life mm -hmm. around racism and classism because you started telling stories early on. And I'm not sure I heard the difference as I came out of class privilege and we'll hear your story in a moment. But I, again, want to deeply thank you for your work in the world and mostly for your love of me because mm. I am deeply different because you being in my life. Oh, thank you. Thank you mm. so much. I am thank loving you. just the two of you. I can't wait to talk about this. And um, mm. what I appreciate is the full circleness uh, as SJTI, so the Social Justice Training Institute, was where I started really delving into class, right? <clears throat> that renewal experience. Mm. So had I not had that renewal part two, I don't know if I would be an author, wow. you know, being somebody who's talking about this, at least in the field of academia, in such like deep, meaningful, intellectual feeling-based ways. 
So I just want to thank you two for, um, for the space to talk about class and who Mm -hmm. we are. And so that opens up, uh, Jamie, the question that we always um, start with is tell us a little bit about your class story. Sure. Sure. Well, I love, uh, you know, as I think about my own, you know, kind of academic learning around class, right? Um, And some of the earliest workshops uh, that I did, one of my earlier workshops was uh, through the lens of class. Uh, And and I think that it was actually where I began to do classism work was with Equity Institute. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And... uh, um, with class action back at UMass, Kathy and Fel- mm-hmm. uh, Felicia Eskel and, and some of those folks there. So that's where I got to do some delving into the dynamics of class. Uh, coming from a background um, kind of academically and training, where I began to look at the entire umbrella of, uh, of oppression, all of the identities, and really um, beginning to look at um, privilege and the marginalization and came to find that I was only minoritized, uh, marginalized in um, three parts of my identity, if you will. Um, And that was race, sexual orientation, and class, Um, uh, but uh, lived with privilege around others. So began to delve into, I had kind of lived with the marginalization around um, class, but hadn't really looked at it or thought about it so much as marginalization, right? Um, I come from a working class poor background and um, grew up in inner city, North Philadelphia uh, with a working class, uh, when a working class community uh, with uh, parents, uh, one who did finish high school and went on to college and one who did not finish high school. And so again, the intersection of race and class um, is uh, very relevant in the context that um, my mother went to a uh, a church related college, um, Allen University, right, where the options for women was home economics or teaching, right, um, and again, as we think about what that then gave her access to do right, um, uh, positioned her so uh, comfortably or really in the working class space um, uh, uh, as she finished. So when we talk about, even as we talk about first generation college students, um, uh, there is this notion that I still very much identify as a first generation, Mm -hmm. although, uh, so first generation, predominantly white institutions, uh, is different than being first generation college period. But all of that to say um, that I grew up in a community that um, there was no college prep high school. I grew up mm-hmm. in a community um, where, you know, we, there was rental property. Most of us lived in rental properties. Um, uh, we, again, I talk about as uh, working, work, lower working class. Um, I don't say poverty in that, uh, we distinguish the space that we grew up in from uh, the um, subsidized housing, mm. um, uh, which might be named as the projects. So uh, we were better off because we lived in a row house, right? Um, uh, in our city, again, you know, as we as we think about uh, as as I was growing up, I, I didn't think that much about what we had because everybody had the same thing, right? Which was, we had enough food to eat, right? Um, uh, uh, It wasn't necessarily, all of the food was good to us, right? Um, It wasn't necessarily what people would consider good today Mm -hmm. um, or in the circles that I travel today. It's in the circles that I travel today that when I talk about eating the things that I ate growing up and still very much still love today, right? It's, it's not the stuff that gets served at the receptions um, <laughs> that I go to um, or or at the luncheons or the dinners. Um, so we ate a lot of canned and processed mm-hmm. uh, food. I, I didn't even know 
what fresh broccoli, well, I didn't really even know what broccoli was. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's so many dynamics to that class background experience. So we could talk about the food we ate. We could talk about the spaces that we got to go to. So um, I tell folks, our leisure time and when we went on vacation was from my house, from, from where we lived, to my grandparents' house, which was in South Carolina. And I tell people all the time that I didn't even know you could go somewhere other than your grandparents' house for vacation wow. until I was 32. So literally, I was finishing my doctorate before I ever went any place else for vacation than my wow. grandparents' house, right? Um, because that was that's what we that's what we had access to, and that's what we understood. Um, and so um, most of uh, I'm the only one from of the children in my family to have graduated from high school. I wasn't there wasn't the plan. I didn't get discouraged from going to college, but as I said to Becky earlier, I wasn't encouraged to go to college, yeah. right? Um, uh, and I am one of very few people from my community that went to college. Um, and many of the folks that I go back to, when I go back to, because my sister still lives in the house around the corner from uh, where I spent my most of my um, junior high school and high school years. Um, once I went off to college, my mother and sisters, after our father died, moved around the corner to, to a home um, but in the same working co poor community, um, uh, and they've, and she's lived, she lives in that house still today. When I go back to that community, I'm still one of few who, who even left, um, in my generation. And I'm seen as the one who made it, um, out. Uh, so, uh, as I consider my journey, um, it was, higher education that made the difference. Mm -hmm. um, and having gone to uh, undergraduate school and finding uh, a passion and connection to exercise my voice in the context of higher education, going on to graduate school, going on to uh, master's and PhD, um, that then propelled me into the space that I operate today, which um, uh, I would uh, as we talk about in the book, straddling class uh, would say that I live upper middle class um, in not only in my education and access and the things that I get to um, participate in and the social capital that I, that, that I have, but um, uh, but also um, in the uh, resources and finances. Right, so owning owning my own business, um, and uh, and and assets and property and all of those things, and the people that I've had access to, in order to help me to know what some of that stuff even means and to, is about, yeah. right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. so that's a that's a that's a little bit of the class journey. There's so much I can oh talk about in there, but yeah, that's some of it. Yeah, I am. Um you know, just listening to your story as I've known you for years, like, oh, little things that I didn't know here and there. Uh, and we spend a lot of time in conversations around straddling class. And so having family and friends in a different class space, not just around money, but how, as you said, navigating systems. Um, lately, I've been, uh, for the last couple of years, I'll name myself as a first generation white collar professional. Um, cause I think that's really important to add there and there are blue collar professionals. And so how are we expanding how we feel and think and talk about professional, right? Um, and so in your space of straddling, cause, uh, you got lots of access to titles, right? Titles and people and power and influence. And you, um, you still very, still stay very true to who you are from like this working class soul space. Uh, I'd just kind of like to know, how do you navigate that? Talk about it, notice stuff, right? Like, I mean, we could go on for hours around that, but I'll, sure. I'll just ask those. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things that um, uh, my earlier uh, liberation work um, in, in, in this space of class, uh, because, you know, doing race, 
liberation, during uh, sexual orientation liberation, you know, stuff. It, it invited me into the space of examining minoritized identities from a place of wealth and pride, right? And so um, I had done race and uh, sexual orientation work so that as I came to class, I had some tools mm -hmm. to kind of look at what the gifts and strengths are that I that I bring from class. So I celebrate my working class mm -hmm. origins. Like I just, you know, uh, when I think about all of the, um, mm -hmm. I, l l like I always, <laughs> I laugh all the time. You know, even, even right here where I am right now in Phoenix, I always, um, know that uh, I can figure out how to navigate um, having what I need. So food is never an issue for me. I'm always gonna know how to find and how to get food, right? Um, and um, uh, because of the space that I occupy now around class, um, I, I can get all I need for very little, right? Um, uh, I, I have no problem. Like I was at a reception yesterday. I had no problem wrapping up dinner, mm -hmm. nothing, none at all. All of that right there is really good for dinner. Y'all going to do nothing but throw that away. I'm not paying for no dinner tonight. Right. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to have to use my money in that way. Right. Um, I could wrap up enough for dinner and for lunch today. Right. So, so, and um, because I have navigated the space of um, not feeling shame around that. Now, again, mm -hmm. that's not always been the case, right? Right. But not feeling shame around it, um, uh, uh, that I can kind of move into and through spaces and help others not feel shame around it. Because uh, in the space um, that we uh, occupy, which again, uh, often is middle and upper middle, there is this notion, there's an idea, there's a narrative that you should feel shame or, or you shouldn't want to want to take that or, you know, what does that mean that you um, have have Tupperware or that you're wrapping up some cookies in a napkin? You you can justify that if it's like, oh, I'm just going to take these home to the children at one level. Um, but, but there is a whole nother dynamic around. No, no, no. Um, that's for dinner tonight. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, oh, that's some extra stuff that I want to going to take to family. So we do this sometimes with students. So here's the thing: we um, uh, we could talk about poor college students needing food, right? Having food insecurity or whatever. Um, we can sometimes l allow space even for our blue collar workers, mm -hmm. right? Um, to at the end of a an event, it's okay for them. Joe, tell tell the tell the um tell the team, tell the mm -hmm. secretaries, tell the uh, custodial yeah. staff, come on in and get that extra food. And that we we do that with not as much uh, tension, but the hall director, or assistant director, or director, or um, faculty member who um, sees like like I could use that, or actually. My whole my whole family got to eat tonight. I'm the mm -hmm. only one here who has this um, white collar job. Um, right. My, 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 my rest of my family is still, you know, sh struggling to eat and struggling to find out stuff. Um, so I have found. Um, so the first place I go is basic needs, and so I entered with food, right? Um, and navigating the um, importance of uh, being okay um, with you know what you eat, how you eat, um, understanding that it is a privilege to be able to not worry about food ever um, is a thing, right? So that's one of the things. Food, shelter, uh, where you're going to live, how you're going to get around, um, and uh, recognizing that today those are things that because I don't have to worry about them, I can be freed up to do other things in the world. Mm -hmm. I can be freed up to think. I can be freed up to be creative. I can be freed up to navigate larger 
world problems, right? Um, and campus and issue problems when you are um, having to navigate the basics, right? Food, shelter, healthcare. Um, we're, we're right now, um, Sam and I, my partner and I are navigating um, health care system mm -hmm. challenges mm -hmm. um, where it is important that we have it, right? But we're not worried about not having it, right? Um, because we have the access and the resources to purchase it, right? Um, so, uh, uh, and that we have the access and resources to purchase quality health care, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Um, where we don't just have to rely on, um, you know, uh, whatever we can get, right? Um, uh, so as I think about my own kind of navigating, I do know the space that um, shows up everywhere from, again, the basic needs, but also what you're supposed to know, mm -hmm. what you're supposed to be able to do, uh, uh, what you're supposed to um, have read um, and um, uh, uh, be be smart about mm. uh, to sitting in the position that that uh, and and in the circles that I sit in, you know how how politically smart you're supposed to be, what you're supposed mm. to know about what you're supposed to know about the world. like when when people say like this country in the world or this space and and well, I was here in Uruguay and I was um, going over to um, Tahiti and like, where are they? Hmm. Right. You know, they could just as well be in the moon, on the moon. Um, I, I still don't know. I tell folks all the time, I got to Slippery Rock State College because my geography was that bad. <laughs> like I didn't know Pennsylvania was that big. Right. Mm -hmm. I had never been west of West Philly. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, uh, I navigate all the time today as I talk with my family members and close friends from my uh, home of origin when I'm saying I'm in Dubuque or I'm in um, mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or I'm in uh, Iowa or I'm in, you know, um, uh, Oakland or, you know. Like, is that in California? Uh, where is that? Um, folks don't know what, uh, is there time zone differences? These are all things that class, uh, folks who have never left their block, yeah. right? Never left their communities, never left their towns, never been on a plane. I'm still with friends and, and family members sometimes who are taking the first trip on a plane. Um, with it. never have been on a train and never have been to a, a concert or to a theater, right? Um, things that um, that uh, in this class space, I take for granted, I can take for granted. It's really hitting me, not only the differential life experiences, but as you talked about for a moment, we'd love to do more for a moment and then after break, how then our system set up and rate classist attitude set up that if you don't have this social capital, class capital, then you're not as smart. Therefore, you're not promotable. You're not a manager. And well, we'd love to really get some of your insights or some of the dynamics of class and classism that you see playing out in organizations. Because mm -hmm. my experience is, and I know we both worked at some of the similar corporations as consultants, they were so into philanthropy and even that language they used. And look how wonderful we are as community members, but did not, and I don't find many that look inside and say, how are we replicating the same classist dynamics that we are then putting on our website to market ourselves as these great philanthropic organizations, but inside we are creating very dysfunctional, very painful classist organizations. So mm -hmm. with that, where do you want to start? We have a couple minutes before break. Well, Kathy, what I think you, you're naming uh, again is that because of the dominant and the cultural narrative around um, pulling yourself up by your bootstrap and mm -hmm. um, uh, um, raising your class status is supposed to be what you want to do. That's right. the that's the American dream, yeah. right? 
And that creates the tension around inviting folks to look at the problematic nature of that idea, that, that ideology, the belief that somehow this class status positions you as better in the world, right? More of a contribution, right? Um, and that's an ideological thing, a belief system that then creates the um, institutional infrastructures uh, that support that dynamic. You have to believe something first, right? Um, and then create institutions that support that, right? And, and that's what happens. And so, you know, you want to be up here. So that means you have to learn to talk this way. That means you have to learn to um, see things in this way. That means you have to know things in this way. That means you have to um, have these sets of values, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, uh, and that um, as, you know, again, the great philanthropy, just like the great white hope, right? And the great male saviors, again, it is the coming in to save the day to make it better without recognizing how, as we do that, we continue to perpetuate the systems and create um, and entrench those systems um, uh, into our in our in our day to day practices and ways of being. Yeah, mm. so helpful. You're reminding me we're watching The Crown, the fifth season, mm -hmm. and I'm mm -hmm. really struck that the folks in the monarchy are reflecting me, in that I'm watching them not mm -hmm. thank anyone, just expect this uh, elitist treatment. And while I know I have been taught to thank and say please and I also know in my middle white collar professional and now current upper middle, there's a sense of entitlement that I know I still struggle with. And so while I say thank you, when folks in service roles don't treat oh. me the way I believe I, then there's this. So as we come back, we want to talk more about not only your experience in organizations, what have you personally classes dynamics, what have you seen, and then get to a bit more, how have you seen people try to shift those? Before we go to break, can you let people know how they can find you? Because my guess is after this, your phone will ring. You have about a minute, sorry. Absolutely, folks can find me on uh, on my website, the Washington Consulting Group .net. That's how you uh, the best way to reach me. Um, and uh, we will reach out, uh, reach back if you want to connect and talk about lots of this stuff and uh, intersections mm -hmm. and all of it. The Washington Consulting Group .net. Or unityfellowshipchurch.org. Um, so um, this conversation happens both inside my formal uh, work uh, consulting group as well as in my ministry. Don't miss the second half with Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington, Dr. Becky Martinez, Dismantling Class and Classism. We'll be back. Welcome back with the unbelievably amazing Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington, Washington Consulting Group. We left the first half talking about how I have in my class privilege, the sense of entitlement and how dare you not treat me in the ways that I deserve to be treated. And I just embarrassed to share, but mm -hmm. A, I don't know if you can relate, seen me in those, but at the group level, how do you see this dynamic of entitlement playing out in organizations? Uh, and strategies for trying to get folks in our class privilege to recognize that and dismantle it. So we really work to create truly inclusive organizations. Well, you know, I, I love this. And again, uh, Kathy, I, I, I resemble all of that mm. and, um, and all of it, especially um, when it comes to um, travel uh, in this current context, as we are back on the road, yeah. I was just, laughing hard last night as I was boarding this flight. Um, uh, and uh, we're flying United Airlines. And you know, there's this, again, artificial, it's all, all made up, right? The artificialness of line one and two. Like, mm. like, like you have to walk on this side and you have to walk on this side, right? Um, like, like really? Like there's no, like what? Um, is you're getting on the same plane. But I was uh, I was I was boarding the flight. I'm on United Premier Access and so on. Again, you know, right? Um, and uh, it was a long line one, right? Mm. Of, of the group one, right? <laughs> and I it was a, so 
freaking amazing and funny to me because I knew I was getting ready to do this today. That this it, it was just really stark. So I had walked up and I had at first assumed that you know all these people can't be in line one. So let me move on up to the move further up in line. Right? Oh, <laughs> you know, I, but 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 I could see it. So I I noticed it and I said. This looks like it's just a long line one. And so I just was, I, as I kept moving back, I said, one, line one, line one. And then I watched like four or five different men, white men. Now, again, it didn't have to be, but, it, you know, because I was in that space too, but it was four or five different white men that just, the plane was boarding up and it was just walking on up and in and, and mm. they were incensed. There was this energy around, where are you people going? Don't you see? It's the ones. And so the gentleman that was standing right behind me um, had said, well, gosh, everyone's going to be on the plane by the time I I get on there. So I share that story to say that there is this sense of entitlement and that I earned this space. So around class, differently than maybe race or um, uh, 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 gender, there is the um, idea that that I I worked for this, right? Um, So that I therefore deserve it. And so in the context of organizations and corporations, Mm. when parking spots been taken or when um, my seat isn't there at the table or when um, I don't get to speak and others get to have air, it's uh, there's a tension around. I deserve this. Yeah, that's uh, good. Uh, in 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 a different way. In different, um, yeah. And uh, and so I know that um, in in the, in the church, I see this that dynamic mm-hmm. for those of us who are ordained at different levels in ministry. Um, and so who's gonna who, who's gonna they're gonna be a parking space for or in the crowded crowded space they're gonna make sure that there's a seat for the pastors or for the reverends or for the deacons or for the partners or wives or husbands or the, so there's uh the entitlement comes from a place of feeling like I earned it and having watched others get that because of position that feels different than you know um then, then it might feel like because of the artificial construction of race or or, or gender and, and all those things. So that's what again makes and it's be and it's because you're supposed to work to earn it, mm. right? Um, and that you did, you know, I I, I do have a, a a doctorate. You you should listen to me, yeah. right? Um, differently than you listen to her, you know. And we see this today with lots of younger uh, doctorate doctoral candidates um, and doctoral students um, that, you know, have not uh, had uh, a full year of work experience, but because I now have a doctorate, when I sit at the table, I expect to be heard differently. I expect to have access differently. I expect to be seen as uh, ready to lead the organization. Um, And and then the, you do the intersection of race and gender, who does get to do that and who doesn't, mm-hmm. right? Um, be, because of that. So it's it's uh, nuanced mm-hmm. and complicated, but there is this notion that uh, I earned it. Um, uh, it's a really powerful class uh, uh, dynamic. So entitlement shows up in that way. And, and it's something that sometimes people feel very comfortable talking about earning um, and deserving and... Mm-hmm. Well, I, that's right. I, I should be. And others, um, they're just feeling it, um, but don't say anything about it, right? Um, and, and treat people in ways because, right? I even I even find when I'm trying to get something. So um, uh, I, I got into my room last night and I picked up the phone and I called to get, I said, this is Dr. Washington in, mm. right? Um, and experience um, be, to, to get a different kind of service, right, um, uh, in spaces. Uh, now, what I found uh, with without naming that, right, when I step up into a place, and this has happened to me three times this week, my smile mm. has gotten me 
um, as much as not more as my title. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that uh, the way that you treat people is right. not about your how much money you make or the position that you have and so on and, and so forth. Uh, because folks have just get, they know nothing about, but this is your smile. Your energy is just great. Let me, you know, I want to want to give you this, give you that and all that stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, so that was just the, the nuance difference that I, that I paid attention to this week, like title I used to ensure I was going to get good service. And then when I just show up as me, right. um, when people don't know any other thing about positions and, you know, I'm not all dressed in the fancy clothes and all that stuff. The, the energy is what, um, yeah, how you are in the world with people is what, what, what you, when you get what you deserve, right? Um, yeah. And how much yeah. of that is your working class, family, church background? Yes. Because I did right. not learn that. Can I share yeah. one quick insight I just got? Yeah. So I may not be clear. Um, I think imposter syndrome for many folks born into and still in class privilege is true. And so I, for me, if I don't get listened to, and if I don't get seen as competent, then maybe I didn't earn it and I don't deserve. Oh, I don't know if that makes sense yet. I haven't mm, figured it mm, out yet. Mm, but there's something about mm. the urgency to claim my space and to be heard and seen, mm. because if I'm not, then I'm a fraud and well, I am pretending yeah, and performing in this class privilege it's not really that's common. really that's really yeah, that good. is yeah 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 well so yeah I, the now i'm just spinning completely right not in a bad way but around this earn space uh so we think of right so jamie what you're talking about is the like the social mobility myth right the upward mobility myth that it's here that people want to continue to get to which higher education at least very much I don't, we don't just buy into that. Like we create that. That's right. That's right. Uh, um, and then the, like the earning piece. And so to hear it on both ends. So, you know, to have you, Jamie, and then you, Kathy, be in this space of the earning piece. I hadn't thought about that as much. Maybe I also think about that all the time in regards to treatment. <laughs> right. And so, uh, there have been moments where I have been arrogant and entitled and think that I deserve. And then, and that's when I'm like not grounded and not paying attention. Um, and it's those like moments of just being like a kind human, like how do we have humanity with people, which sometimes we can lose in our spaces of privilege. And so how do we like center our humanity again? And then as I hear about United, right. It's like, um, I know that there is, overhead luggage that people would be concerned about but everybody has a seat right, <laughs> right? like like that's yes. not what those are what it's an airline that exactly. everybody has a seat. so like hey first group you still have your seat the same one that's the right you're not gonna seat. get a it's different not southwest right. right where you're at c54 <laughs> right. um and right. so your seat is guaranteed right. um but the and, and i and i understand it like but like I deserve to be on the plane first to be as comfortable first and put my luggage where I want to and navigate how I want to and like take all the things out of my bag. And so it's not just about the seat, right? But it's right. all of these things that the seat provides if you have an early boarding space. That's right. That's right. And um, time, right? Time, time to sit, time to, to, to relax, time to think about. Exactly. Time to be on a call. Time to whatever, right? That's a, right. That's a privilege. That's space that everyone... Um, doesn't have time not to have to be standing right um uh, exactly uh and uh so so as we talk about class and leisure and what you don't have to be worrying about and thinking about and um and so on it's very real and and i appreciate you naming that becky uh in, on on united or american or on delta um or on, on many of the fly airlines outside of southwest you're gonna still get your seat Right. right. So it's about more than the seat. Um, right. And anywhere in group one, you're going to have space to put your baggage up too. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so you, you're not going to have to uh, get your bag checked. Uh, but yeah, so the, that was just, a, again, a very uh, powerful uh, reminder, nuanced moment in the space. Uh, you know, again, the 
the access to uh, uh, an airline club, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, to be able to go in and to sit and, you know, to um, relax um, is, is uh, again, another uh, upper and middle, upper middle class uh, business traveler privilege and all that comes with, with being in that space. Um, and, and so again, as we talk, as you, as you, again, you talk about higher education um, and other industries, yeah. you know, the, the sense that I've earned this. So because of my title, my position, my years in trade, right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that uh, we, we, we uh, sometimes aren't as kind to people. I appreciate what, what Kathy named around, if you're not seeing me as deservant of this, am I a fraud, right? So uh, I've got this title, I've got this position, I've got this, uh, so the imposter syndrome, and then I must um, hunker down and make you know who I am. So I show up in these spaces that feel um, arrogant and um, justified uh, yeah. in terms of uh, kind of the, kind of the way that I get seen and treated. Um, and we see it um, in lots of different different spaces in that way. Yeah. One is I think about uh, just pay, right? So we are in this moment where folks that have been working less are in a demand as they should for fair, fair pay. Um, and what I always appreciate having conversations with my mom is she gets really frustrated that she's like, I have been working and doing this for 25 years. And somebody who, and, and she knows that she's been underpaid. And then there's all of this like undervalued and just shitty treatment. And then she's like, and then somebody's going to come in who's worked three years and they have the same pay as I do. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's really hard to talk with your 71 year old mother about how, like how that should or shouldn't be in like these right. really deep moments. So how do we mm -hmm. create spaces of pay equity, which is critical Mm -hmm. and recognize years of experience is also being yeah. critical. Like what is the value? And I, like I hear folks that are older um, feeling really undervalued, like I've worked 30 years and now we've got to be able to keep our employees. So somebody who's worked two years is going to get the same pay. Mm -hmm. And that's a really complicated conversation to have with leaders, right? Maybe to have leaders. with employees, um, of how it's impacting them on the spectrum of age and experience. Right? Right. So we have yeah. these, like, how are we looking at it in critical ways and how it lands and impacts on folks? Yeah, and, and it really does show, it shows up differently in um, the space of our, our blue collar and our working class folks who are often the folks who have been in job roles for longer amounts of time. Um, and uh, and then new folks or younger or whatever are coming into those same positions um, and, uh, you know, kind of making the same, in some cases, more um, uh, or more money. Uh, and then again, you know, uh, in the spaces where there were professions that did not require um, the a, a, a college degree. Right. right. And so now because you have a college degree, you're getting paid more than the person who doesn't have a college degree and you don't have the experience and they have to train you right. um, to, to do the work. So, again, the ways that um, it continues to be perpetuated is we then position um, formal education over experience. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, you know, I can I'm I'm, I'm a higher ed geek and I, I'm, I, I buy the value of higher education and I and I get when it is real and adds value. Right. Um, but when it's like, well, you know, not really. <laughs> um, uh, do you deserve to be making ten thousand dollars more than the person who made who who is doing at, at one level the same job? Right. Um, that you are, and in many ways, better uh, because of their experience, um, because you have a four-year degree um, that uh, that's just, a, that's a narrative around class. Uh, 
and the screaming that's happening in me is the system sees people as dispensable. And when your 71 year old mother is still having to work, mm -hmm. the system is set up to privilege folks who were born into class privilege, yeah. get education privilege, have healthy, able-bodied privilege. To, I could keep going. Yeah. Whereas yeah. everyone else is seen as dispensable. And I'm just talking with one client and they said, it's such a toxic environment, but people don't want to speak up. You know, there's no psychological safety because the theme is, and they've been told directly, well, there are 10 more people waiting for your job. That's right. So, mm -hmm. right. And so classes can play out in such toxic, subtle, almost invisible ways of you should feel lucky to be here, give 200%. And if you don't, we can't abuse and use you, then we will just let you go and find younger, more energetic people that we can mm -hmm. use and abuse. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's very real, right? So again, one of the ways that, um, as you talked about the weaponization, right, of uh, of class and um, and fear around not being able to survive, right? Not being able to uh, have your basic needs met, and it is not um, as simple as you know it might sound. Well, just leave there and go somewhere else and get another job and. You know, the, all of that takes, you know, some capital, right? Um, it takes personal capital um, and, and believing that you can and that you should and that you're worth it and that, you know, that you're going to be seen and you're going to be heard, right, and, and valued. Um, if you've got all this experience, but maybe you don't have the degree, right? Um, and uh, uh, you know that what you're competing with is all of those who do have degrees and that you're not in a place today where where you can do that or you, that you see value um, in uh, uh, in, in that, uh, just for doing its sake, right? right. Um, uh, uh, so the, the the system is really, you know, I appreciated you naming this whole notion of who can retire, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm very much aware as I look around at uh, colleagues who could retire at 55. You know, there's a um, who could retire at 60? Who could retire at 62? That That's a whole lot of class privilege um, and that uh, a whole lot of safety net and security that, um, and sometimes sometimes that's about um, uh, financial literacy. Sometimes mm -hmm. it is um, right. about what you, what you knew and how you knew to do money, right? Um, and, and where you learned that and uh, and it, and it does and it doesn't necessarily mean that because you come from a poor working class background that you couldn't have gotten smart about that, right? Um, I know lots of poor and working class folks who got really smart or were with folks who got really smart about investments and money and so on. Um, but that's not the norm, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, that's not the, because if it were, the communities that I come from would look different, yep. right? Um, uh, they're, they're really hardworking, um, really uh, uh, smart people, uh, but they don't know the systems. They don't uh, know the, don't have access to, you know, uh, wealth, wealth management or financial management and, and so on such that uh, most of the people that I know in those communities are very much working and not, you know, so we've got this whole new, um, uh, and the language that I'm hearing today is not retirement, but your encore, right? Wow. Um, so um, mm -hmm. you've done all this great work and contribution. And so now you get to do your encore performance mm -hmm. at 60, from 65 to 80 or 65 to 75, right? It's your encore. So you are choosing to continue um, to have an encore because I want I'm still healthy and I still want to be a contribution and I you know can I you know I I don't need to work right right I don't need to continue to perform I'm doing this because I want to do this right um, and who gets to have an encore performance mm. versus right so so when you, when you're doing your encore you can stop whenever you want you already people already got their money's worth without you right. Um, you you still gonna be getting paid. You still getting paid, right? Um, but uh, uh, if you can't have an encore performance, if you still need 
to get paid. You still need to work. Um, and uh, there's so many folks who are um, in their 70s uh, and uh, some, some folks close to 80 that are still needing to work yeah. so that they can, you know, live. Can live. Exactly. And again, uh, when you're talking about um, coming from working class backgrounds, it's not, it's very rarely just about you, mm. right? There, there is uh, this whole notion that what I have is the, fa is, is the families, right? And so we're taking care. And so those of us who live in the straddling class space, um, uh, folks like um, me and Dr. Martinez, you know, who talk about who often are seen as the ones who made it, um, are the ones who are taking care of their families. I have so many vice presidents and president, um, uh, particularly minoritized folks, or ra racial minoritized folks, who when we just get together and talk about the phone calls that we get <laughs> and the cousins we got to help um, and uh, uh, the nephews that we got to help and the, the, the refrigerator broke down and these kinds of things, it's a, it's a caring for family. Um, and so our resources are often in that way, not only the financial resources, but do you know someone who, right, right um, can help us to do this or, you know, uh, whether it's get to school or uh, a lawyer um, or someone who, you know, can get us a building for something. Um, the, there's a there's a lot that comes with straddling. It's a lot with being the ones who have made it out, um, kind of at the uh, definitely at the individual level, and then as you show up within systems, um, the whole notion of code switching mm -hmm. is a very real um, and familiar dynamic when it comes to race. But it's not as clear that that's a dynamic that's happening around class, right? Right? How you what you dress in, um, uh, how you speak, what are the things that you um, uh, celebrate and you tell people about, and that you that you navigate. That's a um, what what are, what are the stories that you don't share when you are at work or waiting for the meeting to start because it's not class appropriate. Yeah. Right? Mm. Uh, Everybody breathe, listeners breathe. This has been quite, quite a conversation. As we wrap up this conversation and wrap up a year of these offerings, Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington, do you have any final hopes, insights, reflections, and then Dr. Martinez, I would love to pass it to you to close us out. If you're okay with well, that. Well, again, I want to thank you, you all. Um, and this is such an important... The institutions, and again, uh, my bread and butter right now, um, and my, my, my home is higher education, um, uh, as I do lots of my professional work, and certainly also in, in faith communities. Uh, but as I speak to my higher ed colleagues, and uh, in particular, we are doing a lot, and, and businesses, there's a lot of work to bring on first gen folks, right? To, well, so we've got first gen people coming in. And there's, uh, again, lots of that is from the place of let's save them, mm. but not recognize the value that they bring um, into the space. And so as we invite first gen folks in, let's not invite them in with the need to change them and fix them, but to also learn from what they bring that will help us be better in the spaces that we are. Um, keep doing classwork, it's so important. Yes, keep doing classwork. So Jamie, thank you for joining us on this last um, session. Thank you folks for being present for these sessions that we have delved into who we are individually to who we are systemically and the groups that we belong to around class. You know, Kathy and I want to just emphasize, continue to do the work. Don't let this be a stopping place. Um, mm -hmm. We did some learning and it is a process and it is a journey and it doesn't end. Mm -hmm. right. And so how do we create our space in the world to create more inclusion through a class lens? Um, and so keep on digging, keep on being curious, keep on noticing how it exists in your organization. 
Um, and thank you for joining us. Kathy, anything from you? From well, my soul, I love and thank you both. I'll have a few more radio shows. I wanted to use my last few to look at class. Fascinating race and racism with a class intersection. And so just so grateful for both of you, for who you are in our lives. Listeners, we couldn't do this without you. you. Keep keep coming in, Center for Transformation Class Radio. Fascinating. I can't stop saying class. This is where we all need to be. Yes. Go well in these days. We'll see you all next time. Thanks to our producers. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. It was wonderful. You've been listening to Dr. Kathy O'Bear on Transformation Talk Radio. Thanks for tuning in and be sure to catch us next time as Kathy inspires listeners to become agents of change, motivate, innovate, and speak truth to power. Step into the courageous you that will change the world. Connect to life-changing conversations to extend your reach. For more information on Kathy and her work, please visit drkathyobear.com. That's drkathyobear.com.